I'm Al Wyman at the St. Louis Science Center. We have with us today Dr. Doug Weens. He is the chairman of the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department at Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Weens, we had an enormous earthquake today. How bad was it? Uh, how does this rank in terms of these kind of events worldwide? Well, this is about the worst possible earthquake that you could have um, because it's uh, one of the four largest earthquakes uh, that have ever been recorded since we started, since the seismograph was invented about 150 years ago. And uh, so the magnitude is 9.1, and it happened just offshore from one of the world's most populous countries, uh, Japan. Um, fortunately, the Japanese uh, nation is pretty well prepared for an earthquake relative to other countries, but this is still a, a terrible catastrophe. The tsunami. Uh, seem to be the, one of the more frightening aspects of this, aside from the damage of the quake itself. What creates the tsunami and how does it travel so quickly? Well, the tsunami comes because when the earthquake happens, essentially the seafloor is, is moving up and down. And so you can imagine if, like in your bathtub, if you just move part, part of the floor of the bathtub up, you suddenly have a wave that propagates out. And so when you have you know, hundreds of miles of seafloor moving up suddenly, then, you, then you're going to create a big wave uh, in the oceans. And that just moves across the Pacific Ocean. We've seen uh, the, the devastating uh, effect of the tsunami uh, as it hit shore in Japan. It, it's almost unbelievable uh, the speed with which it, it uh, came ashore and then how far it went inland. Yeah, the real danger is close by the tsunami, so they don't have much time for warning because the earthquake is just offshore. And so that's, I think, part of the reason why you're going to see a lot of uh, loss of life uh, in Japan because uh, there's only a few minutes of warning when you're that close to the earthquake. Now, I mean, obviously by the time the tsunami gets out to Hawaii, um, you have hours to warn people and the tsunami isn't nearly as, as big. Not as powerful, but it travels at what, what speed? Uh, I think it's about 500 miles an hour. That's almost the speed of sound. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. That seems almost impossible to, to contemplate how you would defend yourself or how you would prepare for that kind of devastation or that kind of a wave, if you please. Well, that's actually slower than the seismic waves move through the Earth, fortunately. So we can record the earthquake you know, long before the tsunami actually arrives somewhere. But then the, the amount of time for the warning depends on how far away you are. So if you're very close to the earthquake, then there's very little time for warning. And what about aftershocks? Is that a concern? Yeah, aftershocks are a concern. Um, they're unlikely to cause a really big tsunami but they would uh, provide further shaking and further damage of buildings uh, in the area right around the earthquake. And unfortunately, the larger the main earthquake, then the larger the aftershocks and the more numerous they are. So that, you know, one of the aftershocks of this earthquake was already magnitude seven. So, you know, that's a big earthquake on its own right. How long uh, might this happen? In, in continuation after the major uh, quake itself? Well, the, the aftershocks die off uh, with time, but they can go on for months and months and months. And um, sometimes there'll all of a sudden be a later aftershock that's very large. That's what's hap what happened in New Zealand, where the aftershock was actually more damaging than the main shock because it happened right underneath the city. Have you been yourself in an earthquake? Uh, only small ones. So I've been in small earthquakes uh, here in St. Louis and also in California and in Japan. But these are sort of, you know, um, didn't cause any damage. So I've never been in an earthquake that was really causing damage. But a 9.1, what does that mean? How powerful uh, well, in terms uh, of comparison is that? Well, every time you go up a, mag a point on the magnitude scale, it's roughly 10 or 15 times larger. So uh, if you think of like the 1906 San Francisco earthquake was magnitude eight, roughly, this one is like 10 or 15 times more powerful than even that devastating earthquake. So uh, something that's very frightening, and yet uh, we're still not at that point in terms of science and technology that we can accurately predict these. 
Not in terms of the time um, and the magnitude of the earthquake. So, I mean, we knew that this area was a, dam a dangerous area for earthquakes. And so I think, you know, there was quite a bit of preparation for earthquakes in Japan. They have good engineering standards for earthquakes. They had tsunami warning, si you know, sirens along the beaches and, and so forth. But we can't tell, you know, the time and the place uh, of the earthquakes, and I don't know if it's going to be possible or not. But certainly this, uh, as you say, ranks as one of the worst. Certainly this is one of the worst. Um, it, it's one of the four largest earthquakes that's ever been recorded, and it happened near a populated area. So, I mean, I'm, I'm afraid that the, the, the casualties and the damage are really going to be very, very large. I mean, the only sort of other recent earthquake in Japanese history that would be comparable would be the 1923 Kanto earthquake, which um, absolutely devastated the city of Tokyo. Um, so that would, might be sort of a point of comparison in terms of damage. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Weins, for joining us here. That's uh, Tsunami, Science, and Earthquakes. I'm Al Wyman at the St. Louis Science Center.